This morning we had two passages out of 2 Samuel, which tells us part of the story of who? David. King David, actually, at this point in our story, right? Even at the beginning of 2 Samuel 5, David is now king over the southern kingdom, because he is in Hebron in Judah, and he's already been king there. And the people come to him from all from the tribes of Israel, which is the northern kingdom. They come to him and say, our king is gone, and his son has been assassinated, and his general assassinated, and we need a king. And God chose you to be king over everything, of all of Jerusalem. So we want to make you our king. So David became king over a united kingdom of the southern and northern kingdoms of Israel. Right? That's what's happening here. Whether, you, whether we see that in the reading or not, trust me, that's what's happening here. Right? They've united the kingdom that was separated by a civil war. But before we get into too much more of that, I have a question for you. Who is the most named character or person in the Old Testament? I'll give you a, a couple of choices. Moses, Aaron, Noah, David, Abraham. Abraham. I'll give you a hint. It's not Noah. It's not Abraham. It's say it louder. It's David. Do you realize that in the in some of our lectionaries that we only get one story on David or two couple of stories on David? You get the David chosen as king, anointed as king, right? Remember that story where um, Samuel goes to visit David's father and he brings in all of the kids and, and he parades them in front of Samuel to, to anoint as king. And when they get to the last one and, and Samuel's like, it's none of these, you have no more sons. And he says, yeah, but he's the youngest and the smallest and he's out taking care of the sheep. There's no way that that's the one that you want. And Samuel says, bring him, we won't sit down until he comes. And when he comes, David is small and ruddy and, and you know, not really something to, to, for appearance. But yet he's the one that God chose to be king. And then the other story we get is um, the rubber ducky story from the Veggie Tales. How many of you know what the rubber ducky story is? If you don't, you, need to, you actually need to get Veggie Tales and watch this because it's the best portrayal you'll ever see of this story that anyone can watch. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. You know what happened in that story? David, the king, right, at that point, was, was looking out of his window from his lofty castle, and he looked down upon um, the rooftop of one of his subjects and saw there was a woman, and she was bathing, and he thought, wow, thank you. I was, I was wondering, what am I going to say here? Wow. He thought, wow. So he had her husband moved to the front of the line and everybody else stepped back so that he would be killed in battle after he had already slept with her and got her pregnant. This is David, the one that we model as a person that we should have our faith after, right? These are the two stories you get, David being anointed king and David with Bathsheba. We miss all of this other stuff about how David was sought after by Saul, and Saul wanted to kill him because God had anointed and named David to be king, and how David was someone in Saul's castle, in his own court, who played for him, right? David was a great musician who wrote a lot of songs, and what are those songs? We actually have most of them. They're the songs, right? David is the one who wrote the majority of the psalms, and the psalms are meant to be sung. They're not meant to be spoken. They're songs. They're supposed to be sung to the Lord. And so here we have the stories of David being king over the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom coming to him and saying, we want to unite the kingdom. After everything that Saul has done and turned us away from God, we want the united kingdom to be back together, and we want to follow after what God has done. And so they named King David king over the United Kingdom. After he had already served as king over the southern kingdom for how many years, did it say? 
seven and a half, right? Which I think is interesting. They say seven and a half, but seven and a half. And then he ruled as king over the United Kingdom for how many years? Thirty-three. Thirty-three. Where else is that number important? Thirty-three. How old was Jesus when he was crucified, according to legend? Thirty-three. Thirty-three. He ruled over the United Kingdom for thirty-three years, and as a part of that ruling, he brought back to the kingdom the Ark of the Covenant, right? Because the Ark of the Covenant was stolen and was not in the possession of of the Israelites. And David went to bring it back. And he brought it back into the kingdom. And as they brought it back into the kingdom, what were they doing? They were dancing. And they were singing. And they were making noise with all kinds of different instruments. And they were praising God. The thing that we don't get right after this, though, is what happened in the next verse. Right? David got worried because he brought the Ark of the Covenant back. But as they were bringing it back, right, it says here that Uzzah and Aho were bringing it back. And in verse 6 it says that as the cart was jostling, the ark started to move. So Uzzah stretched out his hand to stop it from moving. And as he touched the ark, God saw that and didn't like it and struck him down dead. Now wait a minute, God. You said you wanted David to be king over the United Kingdoms, and that's what's happened. And you would... We assumed you would prefer for your throne, right? Because that's what the ark is. The ark is a, is a box that has cherubim on top that is the throne of God. We would assume that you would like to have your throne in your kingdom of your people. So for a while, David didn't even put the ark of the covenant in Jerusalem. He kept it on a farm so that he could see what was going to happen because he was worried with Uzzah getting struck down dead. But here's the thing that David did. And here's the reason I think we're supposed to know this. It's not about praising God, right? Because it's real easy for us to praise God in those moments where everything is going right. Right? We praise God because everything is super and there's nothing going wrong in my life. How many of you have to say there's nothing going wrong in my life? Right? In those times, it's easy to praise God. But when things go wrong and things aren't happening the way that they should be, sometimes it's hard. And sometimes we get worried about the way things are going to happen. And sometimes we, we do things that we don't necessarily think we should. But you know what? God is still always there with us through those times. Because this story shows us that God can take somebody like David. right? David, who is a pillar of our faith. But if you actually read through the Bible and look at the stuff that David did... You would think, wow, if God can use David, God can use me. Because I'm not anywhere close to as bad as some of the stuff that David's done. Right? God can work in and through anybody to make his plan happen. And the one thing that David did that all of us need to do, and all of us need to do as a community, is keep something central. Right? David worked hard to bring what back to Jerusalem? The ark. And what was the ark? It's kind of an easy answer. I've already given you the answer. It was God's throne. But what was in the ark? The only thing that the ark contained was the word of God. And David worked hard to keep central in the lives of his people the Word of God. And David ruled how many years? Forty. How many on the United Kingdom? Thirty-three. Who died when they were thirty-three? Jesus. Who is Jesus according to John the Gospel? In the beginning was the Word. Jesus is the Word of God. If we can keep Jesus central to our lives, then no matter what happens, no matter how far we stray away from God, God is always going to keep us there. Right? And we go back to our opening hymn. I was struck this morning, actually, by the songs. The opening hymn 
in the song with the choir saying there was a line, I'm going to come over there in a minute and grab one of your books because um, I need to get that line. Um, but this, this third, the fourth verse of our opening hymn, when, in, when our music God is glorified, right? And did not Jesus sing a song that night when utmost evil strove against the light? Then let us sing for whom he won the fight. Did not Jesus sing a psalm that night when, e when the utmost evil strove against the light? What does that mean? Jesus sing a psalm, or Jesus said a psalm, the night when the utmost evil fought against the light. What does that mean? Does it not worry you that you sing things or say things that you don't necessarily understand? Because it's saying something that we believe. And we believe very deeply, right? Because in that night, when Jesus hung on the cross, he said, one of the things that he said, according to the Gospels, was, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is Psalm 22, verse 1. And it's an understanding in Jesus' day and age when you say or sing or, or somehow enchant the first verse of a psalm that you're praying the whole of that psalm. So in the night and the time that Jesus hung on this cross, he wasn't saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, he did actually, but he wasn't saying that in whole. He was saying so much more because he was saying the whole of Psalm 22. And you have to read it. Later. That's why we read Psalm 22 on Monday, Thursday, as we strip everything out of the, the sanctuary, because that's what Jesus, when Jesus died, that's what Jesus said. And it's all about having our bones thrown to the dogs and being left behind and being forsaken. But then at the end, God becomes a victor and God gives us everything we need. And while they were singing this one step song, let me borrow some of book. See if I can find this line real quick. I heard it and I thought, that's just the best thing. Give in one step. Leave all your babies. I don't know the future and all that's in store. So I'll take one step, one step to follow. I don't know the future or all that's in store. But I know exactly who's leading me. I know exactly who's guiding me. I know exactly who's going to hold my hand and be there to pick me up and to help me through whatever struggles that I might face. It's about putting Jesus central to our lives. And giving up what we want. And looking to what God needs for the community. That's what it's about. It's about us understanding that no matter what we've done or where we've been, that God can work in and through us. It's about understanding that when we were named by God as his child, that no matter what else happens, that everything's going to be okay. Because God is always going to be there to, to hold us and to guide us. That's what's going to happen for Owen here in just a few minutes. God's going to lay a claim on him. And it's all bets are off at that point. Because he's God's child. And God is always going to be there. We can do what David did, put Jesus central to our lives, that no matter what, God is always going to be there. So no matter what the future holds, take that step and follow him in faith, knowing that he's always going to be there to guide you.